Thank you very much. Great to be here, and thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Okay, I have got a theme today, which is really musicians and reinvention, and I'm going to be telling you about uh, three things, two brand new programs at NEC, one about El Sistema and the Abreu Fellows, and if that's unfamiliar, I will explain. The second about uh, musical entrepreneurship, and then I'm going to give uh, a little um, analysis of uh, where American orchestras are at the moment, and there's a tremendous through line between each of those three subjects at the moment. I'm going to end with a video. The video will be about El Sistema and the Abreu Fellows. It's uh, a, a captured five-minute video which has been specially produced for us by uh, Jamie Bernstein. Jamie is the daughter of Leonard Bernstein and she has been doing a major documentary about our new program which she hopes to have out later this year. But this is a, a five-minute extract which I think you will find to be uh, fascinating. Everything that I'll be talking about will have an American focus, I have to admit, and my approach to everything that I'm going to be talking about will be one of hope, optimism, energy, and tremendous commitment for the future. So here's an important phrase that I'm going to be referring to uh, a number of times uh, this morning, apostles to the community. And I'm going to apply this to the reinvention and where musicians are at the moment because I'm basically quoting Dr. Obreu, who is the founder of El Sistema in Venezuela. And he has said this, young professional musicians have obligations they may not have previously considered. It is not enough for them to love their instruments. They must learn to love their responsibilities as citizens. They need to be apostles to the community. So, let me talk about these two brand new programs at NEC. The first, El Sistema, and what we are referring to as the um, Abreu Fellows. Uh, how many of you know a lot about El Sistema in Venezuela? So about half. So let me just give you a thumbnail sketch of what El Sistema <laughs> is all about, because it is, I think, the greatest musical phenomenon happening in the world today, and that's not hype, I think it's absolutely accurate. This is a, a program that was created about 35 years ago by a genius called Dr. Abreu, who is a musician, a conductor, a politician, has served under seven presidents in Venezuela, and has managed to persuade his government to totally subsidize this program. 35 years ago, he started with 17 people in his garage, now, there are 300,000 kids in this program. And 70% of those kids come from the most impoverished areas, come from the barrios. And if you've been to Venezuela and to Caracas, you'll know how devastatingly poor those areas are. It's free. He has got this funded not through education, but as a social change program. I think that was his genius. The kids who come through this have an intensive after-school program. They're working maybe three, four hours a day, uh, either individually or in ensembles. It's self-replicating, so that if you become experts as a 10-year-old, you'll start teaching five-year-olds. And I think that is absolutely fascinating. If I contrast what we at NEC do compared to El Sistema, uh, at NEC we are all about excellence and maybe as a result of being excellent you're going to play with some passion. Here they play with passion and if excellence comes after that, all well and good. And my word, do you hear the difference when you hear them perform. This is a program and a level of performance which is teaching uh, the so-called uh, developed West a great deal from this developing country. They the whole program is based upon ensembles. They have hundreds and hundreds of ensembles, lots and lots of orchestras. Uh, the most uh, famous of their orchestras is the uh, Simon Bolivar Orchestra, uh, whose conductor is Gustavo Dudamel, who's also the music director of the LA Philharmonic. That's their flagship. That's the orchestra that goes out and uh, creates huge waves around uh, the globe. There is Dr. Abreu. 
We at NEC have had a relationship with Dr. Abreu and El Sistema in Venezuela going back about 11 or 12 years, long before documentaries were made and long before the LA Philharmonic discovered uh, Gustavo Dudamel, who in fact made his debut at NEC when he was 19 years old. Uh, so this is uh, already a very, very in-depth uh, relationship and it's one that Dr. Abreu trusts enormously. And he basically last year anointed us to start El Sistema USA to actually start this program in the States. So we feel very privileged to be placed in that, in that position. There are three parts of the program that we are involved with. And I'm going to basically focus upon just one area, which is the, Abre the Abreu Fellows Training Program, and tell you more about that. You can check out the rest of it if you uh, go on to the El Sistema USA website. So, last year we advertised that we were going to train 10 Abreu Fellows with brand new skills, and we were going to train them for a year, and at the end of that year they would be put out into the market, and we would see what would happen to them. Uh, we had 100 applications last year with very, very little uh, marketing, and we selected 10 absolutely extraordinary young people. Uh, seven of them come from the US, two come from Canada, and one comes from Guatemala. They come from a variety of backgrounds, but these 10 kids have really bonded as a team. I call them kids, the average age is 30. And uh, they have a mindset about the need for social change and the place of music in that social change, which I find to be extremely rewarding just to be in the room talking to them. We have classes during their year with us which are based upon a couple of major subjects. One is based upon musical skills that they will need as they go out there, and the other is based upon entrepreneurial skills that, that they will need to be leaders to allow them to be successful. So they're doing all sorts of stuff. They're learning how to conduct choirs, child psychology, they're involved with programs to do with Kodai, Orf, and Suzuki, but they're also doing marketing, PR, Spanish, strategic planning, and financial planning. We are sending them out for internships, and at this very moment, all 10 of them are uh, in Venezuela for two months to learn experientially how it is done there. They're not just in Caracas, they are all over the country. What is so interesting about the effect that this program has had upon the field, and our intention is over the next five years to have 50 Abreu fellows out there changing the world, that's the remit, at the very least they have to change the world, is the interest that the field has shown. The field, as we began this program, started to monitor us, and of the ten, six of them, before we had begun, were guaranteed employment at the end when they graduated. Six were guaranteed employment. I find that an extraordinary demonstration of the need in the States for this type of skills-based operation. This takes me to my second new program at NEC, and here are three basic principles. The first is um, how do you get employed? There, there have been until recently two basic ways of being employed. You could audition or apply for a job, in which case you were, you'd be uh, engaged, offered a salary with benefits. The second was you might set yourself up as a teacher and eke out a living in that way. There's now a third possibility, which is you needn't do either of those. You can, in fact, do something far more interesting, and you can actually reinvent yourself and place yourself out there uh, in the marketplace. The second, excellence as a default. Uh, the whole music industry is based upon excellence. Excellence is taken completely for granted. There is no point standing up playing unless you're excellent. So how on earth do you create a market advantage when you're out there, a skills advantage? You need to have other skills in order to succeed. And lastly, the world is changing. 
the world has changed, the world continues to change. That's not a threat, that is a huge opportunity for young musicians in the future. We do not necessarily train musicians in conservatories to be successful out there in the world. We don't give them those additional skills. There is now a tremendous movement across America with um, uh, music schools and conservatories to do exactly that. Lots of debates happening, lots of new programs being considered, and that's absolutely the way to go. Because it's out there, it's in the ether, the kids are talking about it all the time. If you don't teach them these skills, they're going to learn them in some way, shape, or form. So we're actually harnessing a great deal of existing energy, which I find to be very, very exciting. And we're getting a great deal of support from our students and from our faculty as well. So what will this look like for the future? First of all, it's, n it's not a separate program. It's an integrated program. And it's a program which will be offered to students, but also offered to alums and to faculty as well, because we feel that it should be widely based, but also we want to change the whole uh, culture of the organization. We want this program to permeate everything that we're doing and to become uh, extremely important. The new skills that we're talking about uh, are, are so various. I'll just mention a few of them to you. Uh, first of all, if you're a young musician, how do you understand an audience? What is an audience? When you're playing to an audience, how many audiences are you playing to? If there are 200 people in the room, you're really playing to an audience which is diversified to 200. How do you program to that audience? How do you present to them? How do you communicate with them? What's leadership about? How do you exert leadership within a group? How do you deal with conflict management? How can technology help you in your career? What's outreach about? How can you experience outreach and how can you have those, uh, those skills out there in the field? What's marketing and what's PR? How do you go about raising money in order to pay for your dreams? And how do you go about business planning? This is not to turn musicians into uh, some sort of business operation, but it's to allow musicians to be empowered and to take control of their lives and their careers. So the hope in all of this is that type of approach from both the Abreu Fellows and from musical entrepreneurship will start to influence organizations. I, I believe for many, many years that the way to affect change in an organization was from the top down. I now believe that to be only part of the picture. You have to affect change from the bottom up. And in giving people a new skills base, in giving them a new consciousness, in giving them a new perception on the world, that can happen. And that leads me to my last section which is all about where orchestras are in all of this and how they could benefit from reinvention. So let's just deal with where orchestras are, the, the advantages of having orchestras. Um, first of all, we all know that they're playing better than they've ever played at any time in music's history. It is astonishing uh, what, they, what they can do now. And the attitude is very much, if you play well, they will come. They are the creators of Western music. This is all about the intrinsic value of music and the great literature that they perform. It's transcendent, it's tr transformative, it does our souls good. We know that to be the case. They are also huge cultural resources. They can help urban regeneration, they can help uh, corporations and their identity and how they can recruit uh, people into a particular city. They are too important to fail. So let's take a look at some of the disadvantages, which I'll run through very quickly. There are huge problems facing American orchestras at the moment, huge problems. Or big orchestras, major orchestras like Cleveland, Philadelphia, Detroit, Atlanta are struggling for their existence at the moment. So let's see what those disadvantages might be. Uh, lack, lacking in relevance. We could really drill down into that one, but the headline 
The first headline has to be audience trends, and the audience trends are downward, and that's the first measurement of, of relevancy. Arcane employment practice. Um, employment practice is about prescription. It's not about creativity. Uh, when I ran the Minnesota Orchestra, I dealt with um, a labor agreement that was nearly 100 pages long, and there was no flexibility in that. High fixed costs. Uh, for the major 12 orchestras in America, you're looking at budgets of between 30 million and 84 million dollars, and entry salaries starting at between $100,000 and $148,000. These entry salaries. The performance practice model, uh, a phrase that I would uh, always come back to, is the vehicle of, of delivery. That is where the major obstacles are for new audiences and for people experiencing. Lack of flexibility when it comes to new media. That all, all of these wonderful new things happening in media tend not to be seen as opportunities, but tend to be seen as threats. Over-specialization, the audition procedure, uh, which is all about how you play, not who you are. It's not about the package of the musician. What are your interests? What are the other skills you can bring to the organization? What's your interest in the community? What's your interest in actually furthering the mission of the organization? What else are you besides being a musician? It's only about you play, you are never spoken to. You're never interviewed. Nobody knows who you are as, as a person. That's incredibly limiting. And then an orchestra. And uh, many of my colleagues uh, uh, have advised me that I'm being very, very generous with this figure. But uh, an orchestra will only use a small percentage of a musician's creativity. It's not using 100%. It's using maybe 30%. So what happens to the other creativity that the musician wants to, uh, wants to enjoy? Well, they will express that elsewhere, but not in the workplace. So the workplace is actually uh, throwing away the huge opportunity of harnessing this wonderful energetic machine. The old maestro model. Um, it, in America, uh, the maestros are really treated as celebrities. They don't quite have the power that to Toscanini once had, but they certainly have the power of the ancient pharaohs still. Uh, I, I could talk on this one for some little while, but I would say, I would paraphrase Clemenceau by saying this, music is too important to leave in the hands of music directors. <laughs> there's an inward looking culture, and the thing that disappoints me more than anything else is that there's absolutely no dialogue between the employers and the trainers. We have no dialogue uh, at, at the industry level. It just doesn't happen. Imagine if that was the case in, in medicine, for instance. Everyone talks about these problems, and they always talk about the problems as being economic. We should, we should open contracts. We should cut this. We should downsize that. We should do fewer concerts and all of those good things. I think that that is missing the point. There's something far more <coughs> fundamental. And I'd like to be creative and actually look at some reinvention as far as that is concerned. The, the first one here, for me, is an axiom, and it's a really, really simple axiom, and boy, can you get it wrong, which is all about orchestras survive locally. It's about focusing upon your community, it's about your audience, and it's about the support of your community. Uh, stray away from that, and I think you're in major, major trouble. The one I would like to focus on, based upon the principles of El Sistema, which we have uh, just discussed, is what is the role of a musician? And I think if we focus upon the musician rather than the monolith of an orchestra, then I think that we can take things in a very new and interesting direction. So let, let's focus upon the musician for the moment. Musicians are amazing. They are extraordinary. They are magical. They have astonishing skills. They are idealistic and they are passionate and they can make a huge contribution. 
But an orchestra is not necessarily a place where that can happen. It's recreative rather than creative. So why don't we just trust musicians? Why don't we empower them? Why don't we delve into their creativity and allow them to really create relations in their communities using the umbrella of an orchestra? And then let's look at new um, performance vehicles. Let's look at, that, uh, at those modes and let's see how those can be changed as well in a very inventive way. And that can involve teaching and it can involve uh, recreating some of the El Sistema ideas. But, and we can also take a look at repertoire and how repertoire can be done. I, some of the most exciting work in America being done at the moment is by individuals and ensembles rather than by the monolith of an orchestra because of the flexibility and the creativity of those individuals. That's what we need to harness. I think that we should go back in time. In Mozart's time, in Beethoven's time, in Brahms' time, in the early 20th century, musicians were expected to do a ton of stuff. They were expected to be all of these things, and they could all do it, and nobody batted an eyelid. Now with over-specialization, if you're a principal piccolo player, what you do is you play the piccolo and maybe the flute on occasion. You're not, you're not out there delving into this creativity th th that you have. And every musician can do all of this to a greater or lesser extent. It is absolutely all there. And we can also have orchestras as well, whenever we want them. So the outcome for me is putting musicians absolutely at the center of a community rather than at the periphery, which is where I fear they are at the moment, allowing the orchestra organization to be an umbrella for that creativity to happen. Actually, I don't like this one anymore. I, I think that uh, Ben Cameron defined it much better this morning when he talked about uh, social interaction. So I want to change that into defining it as social interaction organizations rather than education because education needs to be very broadly defined within that. That defines a new role with the community and it allows everyone to be outwardly focused. And it will make musicians really, really happy and fulfilled, and I think give a sustainable base for activity and a sustainable base for a financial model. I'm going to, by way of introduction to the video, which we'll play in just a second, just a final quote from Dr. Abreu. This is what he says. Originally, it was art by the minority for the minority. Then it became art by the minority for the majority. And we are beginning a new era where art is an enterprise by the majority for the majority. We're going live to Caracas to hear Maestro Abreu's Ted Prize wish. I wish that you help to create and document a special training program for 50 gifted young musicians passionate about their art and social justice and dedicated to bringing El Sistema to the United States and other countries. There was a lot of anticipation beginning this program. I had no idea what to expect. You know, we were going to start shaping something that looked like El Sistema USA. I'd seen the Teresa Carreño Orchestra. Someone sent me a link on YouTube. That was the first time I'd ever seen this orchestra or even heard of Gustavo Dudamel. It's a phenomenon that no one has seen before. No one has seen an orchestra of youth with that kind of energy, that kind of passion, playing at that level. You know, Shostakovich 10, Mahler 5. Um, kids don't normally play that. Being in Europe, you hear the sounds of some incredible musicians and incredible orchestras, but nothing 
can compare to the sound that you hear from, from these kids. And it kind of reignited my passion for orchestral music because I guess I gotten a little um, stale. <laughs> There is a level of passion that they bring to their playing. Maybe it's that they're young, I don't know. Maybe it's, I, I don't know what it is. But, but I just know that that's, that's sort of what you guys want to discover this year, is why is it that they're bringing so much passion to their playing and why are we not? Es un programa de rescate social, de transformación cultural profunda para toda la sociedad venezolana. It's changing the country, it's changing their culture, it's changing the way young people make decisions. I mean, just imagine if instead of the army and military action, that instead it is a music program and you can decide to enter this music program and your life has changed. What I've been doing in Juno is trying to approach teaching as an artist and using music as one of those ways to reach kids. Desde que el niño asume un instrumento con un maestro, ya no es un niño pobre, es un niño en ascenso hacia un nivel profesional de acción que lo convierte en un ciudadano pleno. It's very fascinating to me how this movement started to change the, the way cultural policy is starting to mix with social policy. I think the idea of really bringing classical music off of its kind of elitist throne that it tends to kind of stay in and really making it more accessible. For me, this program attracts a whole new demographic to the symphony orchestra world, to the classical music world. How can I not give other people a chance to experience what, what music has done for me? Right. How can I not? It literally just like, you know, kept me in line. All the fellows have varied backgrounds and varied talents and different things that we all bring to the table. And I think our strengths fill in each other's weaknesses. Right now, it is only a theory. We have theories about what El Sistema is going to do. The practice is what's going to be important. And when you look at what's happening in those Venezuelan classrooms, the whole energy is way above what we expect in a rehearsal room in the US. It's often expressed that it's going to be really difficult to create El Sistema centers in the United States. Yet Dr. Abreu says, you have so much here. It should be so easy. And when you think of how little there is in Venezuela, we have no reason to believe that we can't do it. Ya no la sociedad al servicio del arte y mucho menos al servicio del monopolio de élites, sino el arte al servicio de la sociedad, al servicio de los más débiles, al servicio de los niños, al servicio de los enfermos, al servicio de las clases vulnerables y al servicio de todos aquellos que requieren, a través del espíritu, la reivindicación de su condición humana y la exaltación de su vida. Honestly, I'm scared a little bit, just a little bit to, you know, know of, you know, the type of impact that we can have. All we have to do is show one model that works. In other words, rather than simply disparaging the old model and complaining about it, we just make it obsolete. Thank you. If you want more information at all, I, I brought at enormous expense these wonderfully produced uh, materials for you, and I've left them just outside the door here. Do take them, otherwise I have to put them in my bag and take them back to America, and I don't want to do that.